Once the mRNA is complete, now we are ready for translation. So remember translation, we're gonna use the information that's encoded in that mRNA and a ribosome to read that information and bring in and stitch together the correct amino acids in the correct sequence to make a polypeptide, which will then fold and become a fully functioning protein. Now, this process of translation involves at least three different kinds of RNAs. Let's go through them. So first of all, we've got our mRNA. Remember, at the M stands for messenger. We've just extensively talked about how a cell goes through transcription to create the messenger RNA, but its main function is to deliver instructions to actually make the protein. Number two, second kind of RNA, we've got ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. So a ribosome, if you recall from an earlier chapter, is made in part from protein and part from RNA. And so the RNA that's found inside of that ribosome is called rRNA or ribosomal RNA, and it helps to catalyze the building of the polypeptide. And then the last kind of RNA that's used in translation is a tRNA. The T stands for transfer. The transfer RNAs are going to be the ones that bring in the correct amino acids, and they're kind of the link between the mRNA and the polypeptide. So in this image that we have on uh, this particular slide, we've, we're showing almost all three of these kinds of RNAs and how they're involved in translation. So in red here, we've got the mRNA that brings in the genetic message. And then the brown in the background, this is the ribosome. And while you can't see it, remember that it is part made out of ribosomal RNAs. And then these little seafoam colored upside down socks, these are going to be the transfer RNAs or the tRNAs. And you'll notice that they are the link between the mRNA here in red and then the purple amino acids that are being brought in to make the growing polypeptide. We haven't had a chance to really talk in detail about the tRNA, so let's take a closer look at them. So molecules of tRNA are not identical. Uh, each one has two really important parts, though, to its structure. So one end of the tRNA is going to carry a specific amino acid. And then the other end is going to have what is called an anticodon. So we've talked about codons, right, in DNA or in the messenger RNA that code for amino acids. Well, the anticodon is complementary to one of the codons within the genetic code. And every anticodon matches with a specific amino acid. So this, on this slide, these are three different ways of looking at the same thing. We're looking at a tRNA here. So if we were to sort of spread out and flatten out the single RNA nucleotide strand uh, here of the tRNA, it looks kind of like a cross. So three prime end, five prime end. Um, at the three prime end, this is where the amino acid is going to attach. And then down here is where you have the anticodon, this three nucleotide structure that matches complementarily to one of the mRNA codons. Once this tRNA folds, though, it's going to look more like this. This is a three-dimensional structure, and that's fairly complex, so your book summarizes it here as an upside-down sock. Um, so you've got the amino acid attachment side up at the top here, and then they do highlight that three-nucleotide anticodon. The other thing we have to take a closer look at is the ribosome. So remember that the ribosome is going to facilitate this coupling of the tRNA anticodon with the mRNA codon. We're going to take a closer look at that in one of the next few slides in one of the uh, images. Ribosomes also have two subunits, so a large potato and a small potato. Both potatoes are made out of protein and that rRNA that we talked about on the earlier slide. Now, we're not going to go into much more detail than that uh, in terms of our the ribosome structure. However, keep in mind that there are some differences be between bacterial and eukaryotic ribosomes. Um, they accomplish the same task, but they do so in slightly different ways. Um, and we have actually exploited those differences between bacterial and eukaryotic ribosomes when we've d developed um, antibiotic drugs. So, for example, there are certain certain chemicals that will affect the way a bacterial ribosome does its job, but not 
a eukaryotic ribosome. And so if we take this drug when we have a bacterial infection, it stops ribosome function or the production of proteins in bacterial cells. That's going to kill the bacterial cell, hence clearing up the infection that you have, which is great. But because the bacterial ribosomes work a little bit differently from your ribosomes, the drug can't affect your cell's ribosomes, and so your cells are left essentially alone and perfectly fine, which is good, really good for us. Now, when we look at the ribosome, both the large and the subunit, there are certain features that we need to highlight. So on the small subunit, it's not too complex, although it does have an important mRNA binding site. This is like a little clamp that will grab a hold of an mRNA and hold on to it um, so it doesn't float away and so translation can start. And then the large subunit has three little cavities. These three little cavities are there for the tRNAs to fit in. They're the A site, the P site, and the E site. And they kind of go in a right to left fashion. So the A site, I like to think of it as the acceptance site. This is where the ribosome will accept a new tRNA, as you see down here, bringing in the next amino acid that should be added to the polypeptide. Once the ribosome facilitates the interaction here between the existing polypeptide and this new amino acid and creates that peptide bond, then this tRNA is going to move one space over to the middle site, which is the P site. And the P site here, I like to think of it for polypeptide. And this is the tRNA in the P site that's going to be holding on to that growing polypeptide. The original tRNA that was in that P site that handed over the growing polypeptide to this first guy will then also move one space over to the E site. E stands for exit. And this is where the empty tRNA can then leave and go pick up a new amino acid to bring um, to the ribosome again and do this over and over and over again. Now a lot of that might still be a little fuzzy and that's okay. We're going to go through the process of translation and you'll get a chance to see how that all functions. But the A site is the essentially the acceptance site where new tRNAs come in. The P site, this is where the tRNA holds on to the growing polypeptide. And then the E site is where once the tRNA is dropped off its amino acid, it can exit the ribosome. All right, so much like transcription, Translation also has three stages. Initiation, how do you start the process? Elongation, how do you lengthen the polypeptide? And then termination, how do you shut the whole thing down? And we're going to look at translation fairly simplistically. Um, keep in mind, though, that there are extra proteins or factors that are required at all three of these stages um, that do make this process quite complex. We're going to ignore them here as we're talking about the process of translation for the first time. And then also the building of a protein, this is an anabolic process. It requires the contribution of energy on the part of the cell. And so we'll note that there are some steps within the process where we're going to be using um, some energy or some energy is going to be expended. All right, so let's start with initiation. Believe it or not, the ribosome, when it's not actively translating an mRNA, it's actually in two pieces. So the small and the large subunit are floating around individually. And it's really this small subunit that starts off the whole thing. The small subunit will be floating around and it'll bump into an mRNA. When it bumps into this mRNA, it grabs a hold of it using that little mRNA binding site. Also, at the same time, an initiator tRNA. So a very special tRNA that starts translation can bind to the mRNA. And remember, it's going to bind specifically at that start codon. So here in red is our mRNA. Down here you can see is the start codon. This is an AUG. If you look at the blow up, you can see it here, AUG going five prime to three prime. The anti-codon of the initiator tRNA shown in seafoam here going five prime to three prime, so anti-parallel, is going to be CAU. Now, you'll notice that these match complementarily and anti-parallel to each other perfectly. So this initiator tRNA always has this anti-codon. It always will bring in that methionine. Once those three components, the small subunit, the mRNA, and the initiator tRNA have bound, then through the use of some energy, 
not ATP in this case, but like second cousin of ATP, GTP, um, will come in, it gets hydrolyzed, that gives enough energy for the large subunit of the ribosome to dock behind the existing structure. And when it does so, that initiator tRNA will fall into the P site. This makes a lot of sense because it is currently holding on to the existing polypeptide. It's only one amino acid currently, but you gotta start somewhere. All right, once initiation is done, now we can start adding one new amino acid at a time, reading the codons along the length of the mRNA. So during this elongation process, amino acids are going to be added one by one to the C terminal end of the growing chain. So remember amino acids have two opposite ends, right? One has the amino group, one has the carboxyl group. So you're always going to be adding new amino acids to the carboxyl end of the existing polypeptide. And every time you add a new amino acid, you go through three steps. First step is called codon recognition. This is where the anti-codon recognizes the codon. Number two, we have peptide bond formation. So this is where you make that covalent bond between the existing polypeptide and the new amino acid that was brought in. And then three is translocation. This is where the whole ribosome moves one space over to read the next mRNA uh, codon in line. You're gonna have energy expenditure occurring at the first and the third step. So codon recognition and then translocation. And again, going with our five prime to three prime theme, the ribosome is going to read the mRNA from the five prime end to the three prime end. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this takes place. Uh, so we've got our ribosome, right? And it currently has a tRNA in this P position, uh, and that's holding on to the existing polypeptide, which currently has four amino acids. The A site is free, and so the next tRNA with the correct anticodon paired with the correct amino acid is going to match with the codon at the bottom of the A site here on the mRNA. This is codon recognition, and it does require some energy to be expended. Once that new tRNA is in the correct spot, now you can have the peptide bond formation taking place. So you're gonna link this circle amino acid to this square amino acid here, and the peptide bond is going to form, and essentially this will move the entire polypeptide chain over to this first tRNA, as you see here. Now, we've linked that amino acid to the growing polypeptide, we're ready to read the next codon. And here, again, through the use of some energy, the ribosome is going to translocate. It's going to move one space over. So this empty tRNA moves into the E site, you see here, and it leaves. It's going to go pick up a new amino acid. This first tRNA down here that's holding on to the polypeptide now moves into the P site because, again, it's holding on to the existing polypeptide chain. And the A site now is available for the next tRNA with the next amino acid to come in and bind so the whole process can happen once more.